Blending Palace, it's so interesting that apparently Her Majesty, whenever she goes there, always says, why is your palace bigger than mine? We're at a quintessentially British event, Sir James. What brings you here? But this is an amazing place. I've never been here before. I've obviously been to Blenheim, but not to the Salon Privé before. This is the Duke of Marlborough Award. So, Your Grace, would you like to present Ben with his award, please? Andrew, we're at the Salon Privé. What brings you here? We've been before, we've enjoyed it. I like cars. It's a nice setting. You know, it's just a nice thing to do. What's special about British cars, when they work, <laughs> they have a personality, a character. What would you say is the defining qualities of being quintessentially British? Well, I think that we're, we're very friendly people. I think we're very relaxed and creative and I suppose a little bit quirky. And you think of all of the incredible things that have come out of this country. From the Rolling Stones and the Beatles to Aston Martin. I mean, it's an absolutely fantastic mesclage of excitement and creativity, I think. Our feature documentary is called Quintessentially British. What does quintessentially British mean to you? Unique, I think, probably is, is the best way to describe it. It's very difficult to pin down what it means to be British. There is something about self-deprecation, something about attachment to history and tradition, quiet pride, being in a garden, a green space. I think of our British sense of humour is really what the British people turn to in times of trouble and what helps us get out of it. Well, I think the way we speak, because we're full of irony, so ironic, and always saying things we don't quite mean. There's always, what, what, what did he mean when he said that? There's always that element. I love that. Politeness, kindness, stuck-upness. When American friends of mine come over here, they often say, oh, you know, the English are so friendly. And I think to myself, and I sometimes say to them, they're civil. Uh, they're not really <laughs> necessarily friendly, but, you know, they're polite. In a way that, you know, in America, you go into a shop or the supermarket and, you know, they're all over you with this kind of, you know, bonhomie, which then is just switched off. You know, we don't overstate things. Americans are all about these big gestures, aren't they? And, you know, when they meet each other and they're sort of, oh, it's fantastic to see you. We're a little bit quieter, you know, it's sort of assumed that it's good to see you, but we'd really just rather sort of get down to talking about uh, what's going on. <laughs> we do like to go our own way and do our own thing. And uh, listening to other people can be difficult at times. <laughs> I kind of have a strict sense of formal etiquette, but in truth, Anybody who spent any time with normal British people know that we're basically, a lot of the time, drunk. So we're a mass of contradictions. I think if you ask my wife what the quintessential characteristics of an Englishman are, she would say good manners, respectful behaviour, decent standards of dress. Perhaps she's a little old-fashioned in that. Just being very English. <laughs> if 
The cliche of the Englishman is his politeness, his discretion, his privacy, obeys the rules. Is it any wonder that those same people love going to the theatre where everything is different and people let their hair down and sometimes their pants? We love the theatre because so many of us are not theatrical in our lives. And the most famous Englishman who ever lived wrote plays, but was an actor. Not a king, not a politician, not an athlete, not a saint. Our national hero is an actor. Of course, other cultures love their theater, and everyone loves storytelling. It's a very, very basic need, but the Brits have cottoned onto it perhaps more than most. We've been, we've been at it a long time. Just do a sound check, Ian, just... Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sir Ian McKellen. Um You, please, I'm, I'm not, sir. Okay, okay. It's a, that's a title, it's not a name. Unless you're calling everybody else Mr. Sure, okay, Ian McKellen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I began to like Shakespeare by going to see his plays, not by reading them or being taught them. He knew, it seems better than any other writer who ever lived, the variety of human needs and passions, desires. That's the basis of it all, is the jealousy, the love, the hatred, the fear. Shakespeare, in one speech, tells you more about the life of a man from cradle to grave than a thousand pages of someone else's writing could tell you. We love tales of horror and violence and murder and people doing terrible things to each other. And Shakespeare does them so brilliantly. He only invented one plot for himself in the whole of the third seven plays. That was the last play he wrote. All the others he pinched. What, from history books, from poetry books, from other people's plays. There was a Hamlet play before Shakespeare wrote his. We filmed Hamlet before we put it onto the stage. And when we were filming it, the Duke of Edinburgh died. The Duke of Edinburgh dying as we were filming a play about a royal family who lived in a castle. And here we were in the shadow of Windsor Castle. We were filming the castle. You know, the queen losing her husband after so long. Here we are doing a story about a queen who loses her husband and marries her husband's brother. It's hard not to see what the connections are. Ian McKellen was wary of playing Hamlet because he's 80 and Hamlet's 20. But I thought he can respect the language and the poetry, but still make it his own and make it modern. Because whilst he's known now as Gandalf, he's still sort of known for being this great, great Shakespearean actor. Oh, we're living in an age when an 82-year-old man is pretending to be a 22-year-old boy. Uh, that specific man doing it, McKellen. Uh, here we are, it's live. Uh, never forget, you, you can never forget when you're seeing a Shakespeare play that that's exactly what you're doing. You're seeing a play. Dame Judy, to your left, please. Over here, please, Judy. You know, we were filming with Serene McKellen with Hamlet, and you, of course, played Ophelia in Hamlet, and Hamlet... And, and Gertrude. And Gertrude, and Ophelia... Not in the same production. <laughs> Not in the same production. <laughs> what, what is it about Shakespeare that is so quintessentially English and beloved around the world? I have two passions. One is Shakespeare, the other is trees. And I was brought up on Shakespeare as a little girl. Then my family used to quote it. Reams of it. I could do, I could do a whole play for you now. If you'd like The Dream or Twelfth Night, I could do all that. I could do a lot of measure for measure. I could do a bit of The Merchant of Venice. It's a good note to give to Tyro, uh, actors of Shakespeare, is uh, you, you know Shakespeare was an Italian. To be or not to be, that's the question. I mean, uh, uh, Italians, the cliche for, for us who are not as Italians is that they never stop talking. You could say the same with the Irish. Uh, and talking very well. Good talk, not idle chatter. 
but done with great flair and uh, imagination and, and metaphor and, and, and uh, a variety of, of, of pace in the speaking and, and, and the hands and the gestures come into it in a way that the British wouldn't uh, express themselves these days. I mean, we, we've had the Victorian era to live through to, to change our collective personality and national personality, but I think Shakespeare's characters are much more what we think of as Italian or Irish. My world at the moment, we talk so much about the provenance of where your item is made. And I think what's so interesting about the Queen, but also the royal family at large, is they've always shopped that way. They've always supported the Savile Rose, the Henry Pools, Prince Charles gets his John Lobb shoes, the Duke of Edinburgh, a lock and co cap. And that's so important to them to support these brands and to give them their royal warrants. And I think it's often underestimated how important that is and how that keeps these businesses alive. I have to confess that I have never, ever been able to afford to go to Savile Row to buy, to buy my clothes. But I think there is something about precision, tailoring, genuine craftsmanship that is an important bit of British making tradition. The sartorial elegance, which is actually partly seen in Downton Abbey, is very British, whether it's through James Bond or the Savile Row tailors. I think the British are known for it. It's trying to set a high bar. In some ways, of course, that's what His Royal Highness Prince Philip set out to do. He always encouraged people to be the best. And that's where you should aim for. Not half tying a tie, but tying a tie really well, learning how to do something really well. You know, looking at someone's shoes, are they polished or not? And I still find I look at someone's shoes just glancing down, just seeing whether they're polished or not. My husband gave our son a 21st birthday present of a suit from Savile Row. So it's that wonderful process of choosing the fabric, of deciding it, of getting measured, of getting adjusted, that whole process and journey is a delight to watch. There is no other street like Savile Row. Through the generations it's survived, and it's survived because of obviously the great houses and the names that have existed here on the road. We don't claim to be in fashion at any one time because fashion comes and goes, it's like the tide, it comes in and out. Bespoke is a tailoring term and the young will always have a need to create things that are unique for them. Henry Poole really is the founding fathers of Savile Row and also the great inventors of the dinner suit, otherwise known as a tuxedo. It's a great honour to be at Henry Poole and being known for dressing some of the great names of the past, such as Vanderbilt, such as J.P. Morgan, such as Napoleon III, such as the Tsars of Russia, even the Emperor of Japan. Still today, these names stand. Winston Church was probably one of our great men that uh, walked in here. And, of course, he came to us as a young, slim gentleman and got to meet my great-grandfather and my grandfather. And my grandfather remembered talking about his suits that came in for abundant alterational cleaning due to the cigar smoke. And he would always find little bits of ash and stubs inside pockets, which is very much his character. But he was a, apparently a, a wonderful man, even though he was quite moody at some points, you know. And we did have little tit-for-tats over bills that were eventually sorted. This is what we call measure books. So we would have measured Winston's father. And this is 1886, by the looks of it. Later on in life, Winston came to us in 1906, which is there. And that's some of his clothes that was made. You'll always meet customers and uh, get to know them, which is the best part of the business. How would you like your pockets here? Because this is a big question here. Well, well, well generally, I, I don't use them. You know, I won't be putting any cigars in them. You like should. Churchill. You yeah, should. I should. <laughs> four working buttons on the cuff. So there's four working buttons yes, here. Yes, yeah. Pleats or no pleats? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, you're, you're not yeah. strong on the thigh, yeah. so you don't need to have pleats. Right. Uh, Zip fly, button fly. A zip fly. Well, I have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> but most people at zip. It's a single-breasted button two notch lapel. 
So that's your plain weave yeah. with no colorway. That's your, your pinhead showing the actual distances between the two colorways. And, the, and I probably would put it between those two. So, Simon, I think executive decision. I think let's go, yeah. let's go for this. Yeah, I think that's a lovely one. It perfectly works well. It's smart, casual, and dress it up, dress it down. And it also has a bit more character. It has a little bit more of the depth in the marbling effect with the pinhead. So it's a good, good choice. So when you mention Savile Row, I immediately think of the Beatles and their last live performance on the roof at number three, Savile Row. Sadly, a bit before my, my time on the row, there's quite often tours that come, they will always stop outside at the Apple building before they come and stop here at number 10 Savile Row. We're very fortunate we have quite a, an eclectic range of customers, officers in the army to captains of industry, and we have been known to make the odd outfit for heads of state. Thankfully, I've still got my head. <laughs> Prince William and Prince Harry did their year at Sandhurst, and whilst they were training there, we were asked to make their initial uniforms. We received a great accolade in the fact that their first official portrait was of them wearing their uniforms made by Dejan Skinner. When Prince Harry married, we were approached and asked if we would make the frock coat uniform for the Blues and Royals, which was his mother regiment other than the people that were measuring and doing the fitting. No one actually knew who we were making it for. We're going to be making you a, a sports coat, but a sports coat with a difference. This jacket here is um, what we call the Bentley coat. We've utilised the Bentley stitching that is seen on every car steering wheel, and I understand that it takes 50 man-hours to make a Bentley steering wheel which is, funny enough, the same period of time it takes us to make a two-piece suit, 50 to 60 man-hours. The buttons are an engraved Bentley wheel nut that would have been on all of the original Bentleys. Get the rubber hammer out, bang it, untwist it, wheel comes off. A bit like Formula One, but not as quick as Formula One these days. My full name is Adrian Bailey Nottage Palmer, and I am the fourth Baron of Reading. And I'm terribly fortunate that I'm able to wear quite a lot of my father's clothes, and indeed my grandfather's clothes. When I got married, I actually wore my grandfather's tail coat, which was made in Savile Row in 1921. Huntley and Palmer's was founded by Thomas Huntley. The Palmer's and the Huntley's were, in fact, related. And as things took off, he wrote to his cousin and said, will you come and join me? Huntley and Palmer had a royal warrant from every royal family in the world. Beat that. I was the last member of the family to do what they called a really old-fashioned apprenticeship. And I always remember when I went to the Huntley and Palmer factory in Heighton, they didn't like the idea of the boss's son coming up here. And my first job was to get all the chewing gum off the floor of the ladies' loo. I swear to this day that that lavatory had never been so clean. They thought I would last about five minutes, whereas in fact it took me about five hours to do. I think I'm very fortunate because I've had my biscuit life and then I've had my farming life. I was 39 when I inherited the title from my uncle. I always slightly assumed that I would have inherited the title from my father, but sadly he died before he was um, 71. I nearly always actually have a bite to eat at lunchtime in the staff restaurant where the food is frightfully good and quite a bit cheaper than upstairs. should be abolished, definitely. The House of Commons, I think, is the most incredible institution on the planet. The Lords? Mm. Anything hereditary without actually doing it yourself and achieving it yourself shouldn't be around. I don't see why, you know, you should get there through birth. I think that's just ridiculous. It's a bit outdated, if you will. 
So I've had the House of Lords be called the most expensive daycare facility for the elderly with their subsidised meals paid by the taxpayer. But that's all OK. I mean, we have the House of Commons, right? <laughs> I thought we were just going to talk about some gardens here. I haven't studied it in great depth, to be honest, but it probably could do with a bit of modernisation. Um, but I quite like the decor, so don't modernise that. I'm quite keen on the House of Lords. People want to abolish it, but basically it could be renamed a House of Experts. Somebody once said to my children's mother that I, I speak on every subject. That is not true. If, for example, there was a big division um, on a health bill amendment, um, I probably wouldn't vote unless I'd spoken to somebody who had health knowledge. In the 30 years that you've been here, what are you most proud of? Being able to participate, particularly on amendments to various bills, being able to change the course of history. I, I, I think you famously described um, Manderson, your home, as it had 109 rooms, but how many rooms too many? 100. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so funny. The first thing you get given when you come here is a clothes peg, and then if you're lucky, um, a locker, and then even luckier still, a desk. And I've actually kept my great-grandfather's um, nameplate, which I'm very proud of. This is a World Heritage site. This is an important building. This is a working museum. It is the People's Parliament. It is for the future of this country. And I believe in this building. I believe in the fabric of this building. And I believe in democracy. And this is the home of democracy. Which of the Commons, which of the Lords? Well, the good thing is, we always know, if you're at this end of the building, everything's green. If you go to the other end, it's red. So we have that bit in the middle of no man's land. Do I look in envy to the Lords? I've got to say, it might be a little bit grander. It might have a little bit more gold gilding than we have. But the reality is, we are the elected house. We are the democratic house. This is supremacy when it comes between the two houses. Democracy is never perfect, we will all find fault. But if you're going to find one democracy that people want to copy, it's this one. And can I stand by what I represent here? Absolutely. Am I proud of Westminster democracy? Yes, of course. And I'm so pleased that there are so many parliaments around the world that's based on this democracy. And that matters to me. And it matters the role that we played around the world in ensuring democracy comes first. And the Westminster model, I think, by far, yes, I'm going to say, it's the best model that we've got. Part of my family is not only my wife, daughter, and the grandchildren, but it's also the pets, isn't it? You know, Boris the Parrot thinks he's a politician. He loves coming to Parliament. He shouts order, order, lock the doors. Betty, a Patterdale Terrier who wants to keep charge of everything. And of course, I've got Maggie the Tortoise. Why is she called Maggie? She's not for turning and she's got a hard shell. So of course, as you realise, all the pets are named after politicians. They all are part of the family. They play the role. And quite rightly, they don't miss out either. I've always thought that I had the great advantage of growing up as a teenager in the 1960s. I came out of that period wanting to change the world. And I decided that democracy was the way to achieve change. I wanted to come to Cambridge, so I applied. I was absolutely terrified. I did a terrible interview. But remarkably, Pembroke College gave me a place. Spending a really wonderful period of time here, burying myself in English literature, was not just a treat, but it was a rather wonderful preparation for life. One of the things that inspired me in Cambridge was a supervision with one of the fellows. We had written essays, they weren't terribly good essays. He said, let me tell you what Wordsworth and Coleridge were really all about. 
And for the next two hours, he paced up and down, he pulled books out of the bookcase and read quotations at us. He conjured up a whole world for us. And that is the power of a good supervision. It can inspire, it can fire your imagination, it can fire your passion. That transference of enthusiasm and inspiration is what Cambridge teaching at its very best is all about. It's no accident that Cambridge has produced over a hundred Nobel Prize winners because of the quality of intellectual attainment, the depth of research, the quality of teaching. If we lost that, we would be diminished terribly. The ability to offer to the very best and brightest of our students here in Britain an opportunity to flourish and to shine. I was at Cambridge on a scholarship, so I didn't get there through privilege. But once you're there, you realize that you're part of a, a great deal of historical privilege. If I hadn't been to Cambridge, perhaps I wouldn't have been invited to go to the Royal Shakespeare Company by these Cambridge people who were running it. I went for the interview and I didn't get in. But I think they saw that I wasn't properly posh, that's why. And I was just talking a lot. And I think they were like, oh, please. Not bitter, though. I'm definitely not bitter about it. I never think about it, even though it was 20 years ago. My experience of Cambridge was that I flourished because I went there to work. I loved it. It was very high pressure. Now, a lot of students couldn't take the pressure, wouldn't enjoy the pressure, would hate the pressure. I'm Callum Sullivan and I've recently graduated with a degree in music. I captained my Cambridge crew in the boat race against Oxford to victory. When I really decided I wanted to apply to Cambridge and put in the work that meant that I could get there was actually probably watching a boat race. <laughs> I realised at that point that this was an event that was really special and that I actually had the capacity to possibly be in this environment. Best decision I ever made. <laughs> Once you're part of this boat club, you have to be, particularly for the six, seven months leading up to the race, totally locked in and making sure that you're getting as much out of yourself as you can. And we're all expected to do really well in our studies as well. So it is a bit of a challenge and one that's really, really great learning. We usually end the week on a pretty tough session on Sundays. Earn the day off, we tend to say. Get up a little bit later than usual on Monday mornings. Head to Nanomex for a Monday burrito on the student deal. You know, when you're sitting on the start line on race day and you know that there's something like six million people watching on BBC One and you know that there's 200,000 people on the banks of the Thames and you're sitting there and you're absolutely trying to do anything but uh, make a mess of the first stroke and end up losing your crew the race. And that's basically all you can think about. Otherwise, you do, you, you do exactly that. And to hear the roars of the crowd coming through Hammersmith Bridge, it's a really special thing to be part of. So my first black is, uh, is, is yet to go up. It's somewhere in one of the corners of the room. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's my black there. And I'm right in the middle in the five seat. And I think it's destined for one of these spaces on the walls up here. This race has been part of national culture a little bit for so long. I thoroughly enjoy the Oxbridge boat race. My number two sister went to Cambridge and Geordie went to Oxford and my number five sister went to Oxford as well. So there is this extraordinary rivalry, light blue and dark blue. And obviously as children, we were always very excited if somebody sang. We were usually waiting for that. It was the first thing I ever saw on television. I was walking past the shop front and there was a crowd looking into the window and I went to join them on a little screen about that size. There was a brown, shady image. And I realised it was moving image. And it was happening at that moment. And uh, so that's the first time I saw television. <laughs> oh, well, I, I've always wanted Cambridge to win the boat race because my uncle went to Cambridge. It's not really a race, is it? Because it's the same two competing for something that's largely irrelevant to everybody else. originated in England, originated in the countryside. I can't possibly imagine what it was like back then, but look at where we've gone to. 
cricket, I think, is part of tradition. And of course, the Lord's Cricket Ground is as much about the ceremony as, I guess, the game itself. You've got Lord's Cricket Ground regarded as the home of cricket. And it's still only colonial countries who predominantly play cricket, which says everything about the game. Cricket is essentially a quintessentially English pastime. There's very few games where you can play for five days, go home, do anything you like in between, and at the end of five days have a draw, and everyone be relatively happy with that result. I was brought up on cricket because at the end of our garden in Wigan was the local cricket club, and I watched the, the ground through the seasons. In the winter when it was fallow and snowing, and then the spring when the grass could be cut and the players arrived to practice. And then at the weekends when they actually played games, I could watch them. And I became not a player of cricket, but uh, I was in the score box, marking the rather complicated way in which points are scored in cricket. You go to a cricket match and you don't have to watch it all the time. There's plenty of time to have a chat with the person next door to you, often about cricket. But, oh, they're starting again. To think of it as a game in which people win and lose, no, it's a different sort of game altogether. It's the game of life. Uh, OK, in my house, there was no cricket, there was no rugby, there was no Aussie rules, none of that stuff. We all sailed. I don't know anything about team sports, nothing. You, you're truly asking the wrong Australian. They, I can't believe they didn't take away my passport, but yeah, I don't know anything about cricket. Sorry. Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh many times attended test matches, often meeting the players on the field of play during the tea interval. Only on one occasion has the Queen actually stayed for lunch, however. That was during a test match against Australia. Her favorite tipple, de Bonnet, was not present. So a member of the kitchen staff had to be dispatched to find an off-license somewhere in St John's Wood or Maida Vale, which had a bottle of Dubonnet in stock, and then had to dash back to the ground in time to serve the Queen her favourite aperitif before lunch. Just one of the little extra measures that we take to ensure our special guests are well looked after at this ground. I lived in Bloomsbury for several years in London and it's an area that's very special to me and I think what I love about it other than the Dickensian heritage is all the little like twists and turns and you stumble upon these small museums that you may not have known existed. I particularly love the Sir John Soe Museum and it's quite famously said that the British are such avid collectors and there's no better example of a random, delightful, at times horrifying collection of antiquities hidden away on a quiet street in Bloomsbury. People look at these buildings, they look at a place like this and they see something that's really like a fly in amber. We're in the library dining room of Sir John Soane's townhouse, which became, after his death, his museum. He was appointed to be the architect of the Bank of England, and that was probably his greatest achievement. And he was awarded a knighthood. He was also fortunate in marrying an heiress, Eliza Smith. One of the great tragedies was that only two years after they moved into the house, Eliza Soane died. Sohn was disconsolate. The tomb he designed a few months after her death, and it was a remarkable departure from contemporary tombs. Giles Gilbert Scott must have looked at it, and being intimate with the house and the collections, it would have come to him as an edicule which offers shelter for communication. Gilbert Scott, who designed the phone box, he saw this and thought, that shape. And I hope he thought, and that love story will be just perfect for this new invention called the phone. His inspiration it was a brilliant bit of lateral thinking, if you like. Gilbert Scott wanted it to be silver. But the post office said, oh, no, budget, budget. And they said, it's going to have to be red. And now that's an iconic sense of Englishness in this country and right around the world. So we're here today at Henry Pool at this stage. We've done now the pattern. We've gone through the detailing with yourself. Back width is good, shoulder width is good. At this point, I'd be asking you if there's anything you don't like, 
anything you want to change, you know, button height, um, sleeve length, they're just a little bit short. So I'm just gonna put a good quarter of an inch on those. And then you should show about a centimeter, three eighths of shirt cuff. Sure. I mean, I, I really like how comfortable it feels and how light, and also I like the color. Obviously, it's a little bit livelier than a plain navy, but without being overly flashy, you know, if you had a real electric blue suit, then, you know, how many times are you going to wear it before you get bored or people say, here he comes in his electric blue suit again? We have to admire the entrepreneurial spirit of the original John Lobb, who in 1863 saw the Prince of Wales in the park and saw that he'd left a muddied footprint. And then he used that as an imprint to make his first riding boots, which he gifted to the Prince of Wales before he was king. That's how the long-standing relationship with this heritage brand, the royal family, and of course the royal warrant that John Lobb has carried for so long came about. My great-great-grandfather founded the firm. The fact that it's a family-run business, behind that family-run element of it is the fact that it's an independent business. And I think it is that element of independence which is maybe a quintessentially English trait. In World War II, when my great-uncle had started running the firm, there was a moment when the bombs were falling on London one evening he decided that it would be best to have to last to move out into the country to keep them safe. Only the next day the building was bombed and it was condemned. The lasts are very much the lifeblood of the, of the firm. Keeping those from being burnt was a good move. Lost in prison. So those are all old, some old names. I mean, the thing is, we've actually got to the point where a lot of people don't know who these people are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> David Niven, Lord Olivier, Mrs. Peter O'Toole, Aristotle Anossis, Sinatra, oh. small fit. It was well used. He had the, we had a lot of work for him over the years. And so Jackie Onassis, she quite large feet. I have to just <laughs> say. Yeah, she was quite tall. I think she was a tall lady. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Some people I have heard will be asked to be buried in their shoes. Obviously, their favourite items that they may have had during their lives. Well, they, they do say you should judge a man by his shoes, <laughs> regardless of what he might be wearing. This is what we're faced with, which is a, this blue suit, which you're having made yes. um, by Simon. You might prefer something which is a little bit more sort of in keeping with the suit. The one I think that really sort of complemented what you were wearing was the double monk shoe. It's designed as quite a sort of comfortable shoe as well, which is good for everyday wear. British weather is, for me, perfect. It changes every day. You never get bored. It's reliable in its unreliability. <laughs> the best cab service in the world is the London taxi driver, right or wrong? Definitely incredible. Just our origin has been yeah. going so long, it's an icon. It's like a red bus or a telephone box. You come to London, you ride in a black cab. If I got into the back of your cab and said, take me to the umbrella shop. We'd take the James so Smith and Sons. Sons. You're up the street, Bloomsbury. Of course we know it. Yeah. I suppose rain is quintessentially English, hence the umbrella has to also be quintessentially English to protect you from this ghastly weather. Having said that, today we are blessed with some beautiful blue skies. I love it when I see those sort of shops which do something very particular, which are charming, which say something about us, and which I would hate to die out. That emporium of umbrellas, it's a mad idea, and I'm Absolutely delighted it's still there. James Smith and Sons have been in business since 1830 and we're on to the sixth generation. It's quintessential English, but it's actually it's a little bit more than that. The umbrella is said to have started either in Egypt or China, and the real pickup with it came with the invention of steel as part of the Industrial Revolution. People had more money, more time to spend on things. Slowly, then umbrellas became popular in, in London as a fashion accessory. 
A good umbrella becomes part of you. It can make you stand up tall, but it can also make you feel good inside as well. We've always been taught you must never open your umbrella indoors. You always have to store it wrapped up. Part of the folklore that we say is where that came from is that the salesman would tell people that it was bad luck to leave an umbrella open indoors. So then they'd be folded up, they'd be wet, and because they were made of silk in those days, then they would rot, and then they'd come back to buy another umbrella. You go to James Smith now, they've got an enormous horseshoe saying, don't worry, it's not bad luck. You can do what you like with your umbrella. This horseshoe will protect you, honestly. There's a secret part in every Englishman which wants to be the gentleman spy, the immaculately tailored Savile Row suit, the rolled up umbrella. It's as deeply rooted in English culture these days as, as cricket is. If you've got the money and if you've got the inclination to have someone look after you, to treat you, to pamper you, go to somewhere like Trumpers. They may even give you the cologne that James Bond wore. We are at GOF Trumper. It's a flagship store. This has been here 100 years. Open the door in the morning and your body gets the goosebumps going. We always give accessories to the James Bond films. You could miss it if you didn't know what you were looking at in the bathroom, but we usually spot them. People trust us. All the famous people that come to us trust that we'll never mention who they are. We never phone magazines or newspapers when they arrive. They come in, feel very relaxed, as if nobody's recognised them. Ian McKellen? Yes. Oh, I have been there once. Yes, you get a shave. Yes, it was very good. Even the current Prime Minister was a customer of our other branch in St James's. We actually don't do his hair anymore, which is probably noticeable by the haircuts. <laughs> well, he, he pays to get that haircut. I, I just assumed his mum did it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I love looking at gardens, sitting in gardens, walking through gardens. I am hopeless at being a gardener. Sir Edmund Loder, that classic example of an English eccentric, having that sort of passion, that drive to build a garden on such a grand scale, a great deal of it by his own hand. Lenasy is often referred to as one of the most important woodland gardens in England. A lot of the English garden design was taking influence from Europe. After the English landscape movement and the woodland garden explosion, suddenly English gardens were influencing Europe. And apparently Hitler had his eye on Lennersley as his new home. The great English film Black Narcissus was shot here. Sir Edmunds created a landscape which could pass for the Himalayas, certainly with the rhododendrons and azaleas. It's a place to get lost in, a place to wander. And every day it's a privilege and an honor to come in and work in this classic example of an English woodland garden. One of the definitions of Britishness is a love of gardens. So even if you're living on the fifth floor of a high rise, and if you have a little balcony outside, it's full of pots with things growing in it. It's extraordinary. The British love gardening. The English are obsessed with gardens, and that probably culminates with the Chelsea Flower Show every year. It brings a real mix of different types of design in one location for people to just get inspiration from, for their own gardens and for their own houses even as well. This is essentially like the, I suppose, Champions League of, of gardening that I'm, I'm visiting today, I think, and having had a little walk around, I'm definitely getting that sense. This is fantastic. I mean, it's, if you like, in our back garden. <laughs> Chelsea is the quintessential British occasion. It is. One of them. What is so quintessentially British about the Chelsea Flower Show? That we're here in this weather with no coats and no, nothing else on. And it's fun. And it's fun. You get a chance to put a pretty frock on and, and see beautiful things and chat to lovely people. And we are a royal borough because Queen Victoria, on her deathbed, decreed that the borough she was born in should become a royal borough. So that's why we're the royal borough of Kensington, Chelsea. And later on this afternoon, we'll be welcoming some of the royal families, some of the people that live in our boroughs. So it all comes together on RHS Chelsea Flower Show. It's truly brilliant just to meet a fellow queen, especially today where it is the art form of gardening at the Chelsea Flower Show and the art form of drag and just 
just a gorgeous British icon as oh, well. Boy, absolutely. How, <laughs> what a pleasure it is to meet Judy Dent. Oh, brilliant. Is it really bad as well that I really just wanted to joke and be like, it's such a pleasure to meet Maggie Smith. <laughs> but no, it truly is a pleasure to meet you, honestly. Thank you. You look beautiful. Thank you. I was making handbags in the early 70s and the opportunity came to buy Lorna. When I bought the company, it had the oil one, but it had not been really used. I obviously wanted to go direct to the palace and slowly managed to do that. Oh, the Queen is a delightful person, just like the lady next door. Very interested in what we do because when she was in the factory, she spent a good afternoon with us. It's reported that the Queen has 200 handbags, predominantly Lorna London handbags. If I was lucky enough to be invited for an audience of the Queen, I think the most mortifying thing for me would be if she moved her Lorna handbag from her left to her right arm. It is suggested that's her indication to the courtiers to come and rescue her. The Lorna handbag, as well as being a stylish accessory, has become her escape route in difficult social situations. It's an understated British way of getting out of an awkward situation. We're very lucky to be in the Crown. The costume designers were interested in coming to the showroom because they knew that Mrs Thatcher and Her Majesty carried my handbags. That's very intriguing that two silhouetted, famous power ladies chose the same handbag brand. This was the Taviata, which is the Queen's. I know this is a beautiful white one. And Mrs. Thatcher had the Olympia, which was the nearest to the bag that she carried when she bought for me. Both great ladies. James Purdy and Sons have been making guns for quite a long time now. They are probably the finest gun maker in the world, as British gun makers are. These take around about two and a half, three years to build, so this is a real work of art. I knew this would be 100,000 plus. You'll see someone using one of these, particularly on a day like today, which is the Glorious 12. It's probably the most exhilarating sport of all bird shooting, I think. They can beat on the wing at up to 70 mile an hour, which is a real sport. Hitting them is quite a, uh, quite a feat. The Royals are traditionally very involved in country sports, particularly shooting. They're quite well known to be part of that scene, that quintessential British scene. I think I was brought up to think it was cruel to kill animals. And the idea of the posh folks going off and the centre of their activity being killing something, I think you've got to be of a certain frame of mind, of which I am not. I'd much rather they were gathered together and the central point of the weekend was when they all dressed up and did charades, played charades, and put on little pantomime. <laughs> Shooting a bird. Mm. If that's essentially English, it's not an Englishness that I can respond to at all. I look at the glorious 12th and think it is a load of baloney as far as I'm concerned. I'm quite grateful that they're not lapping away at the grass all year long, but it's a quite absurd piece of gastronomic elitism. I don't know anybody who eats grass on August the 12th. But I'm sure if we went to some of the smart hotels in London, they would serve it to me for an astronomical amount of money, which I do not wish to pay. We're at the Stafford Hotel, and today we're in the Game Bird, which is our wonderful signature restaurant. This hotel has been here since 1912, but Glorious 12 goes back to 1853. So ever since that day, we've been serving grouse on the 12th of August and get excited by it. It was shot this morning and it's on its way from the North Yorkshire Moors. It's the Glorious 12th, first grouse for the season. We have it here at the Stafford. It's a very discreet place, so we're not about celebrity, we're not about royalty, but they all come here. So Her Majesty the Queen visits the Stafford. The Queen Mother used to visit for afternoon tea weekly, walking up from Clarence House. The cellars served the King of England when he lived in St. James's Palace. We served the port to the King. It is a very special place. We're going to be going through what's called the blessing. 
The blessing involves the final fitting. We're looking at the small details now and the general comfort that we hear from you and how you enjoy the suit. Also, we have the extra cloth there, which I must say, Frank, if any prosperity takes place, we can have four inches of extra cloth inside to allow that difference in inches. So do not haste. We are there for you. This is good to go now. Of course, in reality, I couldn't show you around because it's members only. But, uh, <laughs> absolutely. We're rule breakers. So let me just show you some things here in the South Library that are quite interesting. This is Faraday's wheelchair. Faraday, our great scientist, was also the honorary secretary just at the very beginning uh, of the club's history. And there we have Dickens' chair. And this incredibly tall arrangement with the three tiers was the cheapest way <laughs> of accommodating this huge number of books in one room. The only problem is that a lot of older members who have vertigo are terrified of going up there, so we send the library staff up to find the books. I can well imagine that. <laughs> the Athenaeum does have an amazing role of honour. Charles Dickens, Charles Darwin, Churchill, J.M.W. Turner, who does those wonderful interiors, member of the club. Uh, wherever you look, in a way. The clubs went through a very hard time in Pall Mall and in St James's, and they were out of favour, they were old-fashioned, they were seen to be a relic of the 19th century. Well, if you read the novels of uh, Dickens and Thackeray, they, are, they always seem to be somebody going off to the club and somebody coming back from Parliament to, to report over a nice uh, glass of port. I've been a member of Private Members Club purely and simply because I got it as part of a promotion and part of my work and what I was doing. But average person, Private Members Club is irrelevant. That's out of our league. Yeah, it's out, out of our league. league. We are just London boys. That's another... It's another world for us. Another world, exactly, yeah. But they're lovely places. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. We only go to the main door, we don't get invited let in, the, we just drop off. <laughs> It's a very useful way of making sure that you can meet someone and entertain them in the middle of London. But I would say it's more a functional thing for me than part of my being and identity. The only real advantage of a club would be that it would be a place where you could go and sit quietly. But who might come up to you and want to have a good long chat? Actors have a number of clubs that they could be expected to join. The Garrick, but women aren't allowed to be members of the Garrick Club. Why would I want to go to a club that wouldn't have women in it? I, I... The men's clubs, they can go there, they can sit, they can talk about racing and backgammon and things. And I don't necessarily want to do that. You also know where they are, that's probably quite positive. You shouldn't regard them as exclusive, just an opportunity to meet other people and to widen your own circle of friends and the bonhomie and the banter that can arise from it. It's fun. It's quite British. <laughs> John Wilson Croker, he saw that in London there were lots of political clubs, there were lots of what were known as fashionable clubs, really for the aristocracy, if you like, but what was needed, perhaps, was a club for writers and artists and scientists which would not be about politics and would not be about class. The club built this Grecian temple and under the auspices of Athena and that sense of classical wisdom, the scientists, artists, writers, judges, cabinet ministers, bishops, whatever their views, they could get along together. A place at the Athenaeum was like gold. This is a very British institution which suits me very well. It reflects aspects of Britain and its history that I warm to, you know, inclusiveness, liberalism and conservatism. And one of the things you have to be very careful about here at club table when you don't know who's opposite you is you might be sounding off about some subject and you find the person opposite you is the world's leading expert in it. So you tend to find people around here are quite cautious. <laughs> Let's check on who's present. That's happened to me. Terrified. 
In terms of the membership of this club, what I've tracked is the story of Britain, because Britain has become much more dominated by the middle class than by the upper class. You're aware of, of, of class, as uh, you know, Shaw said, when an Englishman opens his mouth, you know, <laughs> people judge him. Uh, the Americans are quite good at class, actually, particularly among the upper echelons. But the British have been very class conscious, and some still are. But I think there's been a big change there. I think there's been a big change there. Has the class system changed so sufficiently that we're able to move forward? It probably has, because probably there's more people from various backgrounds making vast amounts of money. I suppose that's the new class system now in our country, isn't it? People who have money, the people who don't have money. Neil, how are you? Frank, nice to see you again. Very well, nice to okay? see you too, absolutely. You too. OK, Frank, so here we yeah. are, all ready for your second fitting. You'll see a slight difference to when you were last here in so much as we've now made the bespoke shoe trees, which my younger brother made in our tree making section. He's a fairly new, new character. He's only been here 30 years or so, so yes, we're still trying to train him. He's a so, lifer, he's a lifer. Yeah, for sure, but most of us are, most of us are. So, but yeah, so the, the, the trees are also bespoke and we're left with this beautifully varnished shoe tree, which is an exact replica of your foot also. So it's got the correct width and contours that your foot has. So this shoe will never shrink back. You do always maintain that size and shape, which is very important for the longevity of the shoe. The Double Monk is a shoe that's been part of the firm's history since it was created by my grandfather. It has a sort of timeless quality to it. So you've got the oak bark sole hammered and shaped to your last and hand stitched onto the welt. Uh, the heel was built up with, it, there's no block heel, this is individual layers of leather. Every pair of shoes goes through four different craftsmen's hands. We've got the closer who makes the beautiful uppers, the shoemaker who stitches all the sole and the heel together, and then the tree makers who make the wooden inserts to go in after. So all these guys are highly trained, highly skilled. It's very much a team collective effort. I get to see you and get all the praise for what a beautiful shoe it is, so I get the glory when they fit well, but by the same token, I also get the grief if they don't, so I guess it's a double-edged sword. I kind of feel like I'd want to sleep in them if I could. <laughs> <laughs> If you're invited to one of our many amazing country houses for the weekend, you wouldn't go wrong by wearing a Henry Pool suit and a John Lobb shoe for your arrival. I'm sure you recognise this room. Oh, wow. I do, the library. Well, there aren't many portraits in it. There's one there of the first style of Carnarvon. Obviously, Geordie and I have got to number eight. What's quite special about Highclere is there has been an estate here, a home here, if you like, for at least 1,200 years. So one of the most special things about this building Heritage Gardens home is the longevity, I think, the idea that you have this great perspective looking backwards, a sense of an anchor, perhaps a sense of reassurance in quite a changeable world. We've been here a while. In 1922, Lord Carnarvon and Highclere Castle were front page news around the world. Against all the odds, Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter, two maverick Englishmen, discovered the steps, the 22 steps which led down to the tomb of Tutankhamun. That glint of gold, that glimpse back into a pharaonic world three and a half thousand years old, captured the whole world's imagination. What a story to have at Highclere Castle. My father-in-law had always told me the story, the end of World War II. He and some of his army friends, with Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, ran around the streets of London and did the conga and just celebrated the end of World War II. And they were all standing outside the black gates of Buckingham Palace, my father-in-law with Princess Elizabeth and Margaret, shouting up to the King and Queen, long live the King and Queen. They'd always remained friends and shared a love of racing. So he was her racing manager, but her racing friend above all. Geordie, my husband and I took over the castle after his father had sadly died. His parents had never lived in it. 
It reminds you that a home is about welcoming friends to the door. Julie and Emma Fellows were good friends, and I thought it'd be fun, and I love putting together weekend house parties. It was where this house started in Victorian times. So Julian Fellows said that he wrote Downton with Heifler in mind. None of us dreamt or guessed how successful Downton Abbey would be, how we'd all fall in love with the different characters, whether it was Bates or Anna or Lady Mary. It's really Julian Fellows' excellent writing and I guess the way Maggie Smith delivers all her lines so perfectly. <laughs> it's just making people happy, that's all Hankley wants to do. Hats have almost disappeared, ties have almost disappeared. Well, uh, we'll be naked next, I should think. Locks date back to 1676. We're the oldest hat shop in the world and one of the oldest still family-owned businesses in the world as well. We originally opened on the other side of the street. This is the sunny side of the street. You always do more business on the sunny side of the street because that's where people want to walk. My great-great-great, however many great-grandfathers it is, was a gentleman called James Benning, and he is famous as he is the original Mad Hatter that Lewis Carroll based the character on in Alice in Wonderland. So I am a direct descendant of the original Mad Hatter. I'm very proud of that. We've got a great connection with James Bond. We hatted Sean Connery in the 60s. In Doctor No, he famously wore uh, Trilby. In Goldfinger, Odd Job wore a, what we call a square crown coke, and that was the one with the reinforced brim, which he used to throw at his victims and um, slice their heads off and all sorts. Famously, the square crown coke was also worn by Winston Churchill. We were very proud that Winston Churchill was a big customer of ours before and during and after the war. When the war was taking a turn for the worst, you'd find that when you look in the ledgers, there'd be an insertion for Winston Churchill for a new hat because it was a way of him lifting his spirits when the chips were down. One of the moments in history that my family are very proud of is that my grandfather fitted the crown for the Queen's coronation. We were commissioned by Garrards, the Queen's jewellers, to make a velvet pad that went inside the crown so it would size it down so it would fit the Queen on her coronation day. So we use a machine called a conformator, a French invention, dates back to 1849, and we still use the same machine today. We haven't found a better way of doing it. Looks like an instrument of torture. I think someone described it as quite steampunk, and I quite like that. Right, OK, so if you look straight ahead for me, plonk the old girl on, get it centred for you, and then just pushes down. Looks like it should hurt, but it doesn't hurt at all. And then we just give that a squeeze. There we go. Lift that off. It's a little bit of an old girl, so we have to give it a little bit of gentle persuasion. And then hopefully, there's an imprint of your head shape. There you go, sir. That is amazing. And it's an exotic looking egg. Yes. <laughs> What I love is when I get a customer coming in here, a young, young guy comes in and said, I've always wanted a lock hat because my grandfather wore one.
have been very patient for the various visits to here. And today's visit is to see the outfit completed now. I am very, very pleased as how it's turned out. My son, being a racehorse trainer, I mean, he's had as many as over 100 horses in training at any one time. And quite how he manages to know which horse to run in which race, in, in which country, I don't know. And of course, a lot of the staff here follow Hugo. Quite often, I'm stopped in the past to go, hello, my lord, I'm 100 pounds better off than now, when I last saw you. We're here at Sandown Park, a quintessential British racecourse. We try and come as much as we can. We absolutely love horses. We have a share in a couple of horses as well, so it's our favourite place to be. And Sandown Park has always been a favourite racecourse of the royal family. Indeed, the Queen Mother used to say it was her favourite racecourse. And Nicky Henderson, who trains for the Queen, is here today. I know people don't like two horse races. I love them, I prefer one horse races. <laughs> <laughs> Concord used to come over 5 to 11 every morning. You could set your clock by it. Right, we're going again. I'm Nicky Henderson, a racehorse trainer. I was always equestrian minded, if you like even from school days, and at Eton in those days, racing was about the biggest crime. To be caught on a race course was a heinous crime. Well, I was very lucky, actually, because the Queen Mother's horses came here, and we had some wonderful times. I mean, she was a spectacular lady. I think she really enjoyed the people that were involved in racing. Racing's full of characters, some good, some bad, mostly good. The Queen took over the Queen Mother's horses and all the mares that were breeding. She adored the horses and she'd love to come down and see them and it's lovely that she takes such an interest in it all. And as you know, racing is probably her number one relaxation, hobby, passion. Both the Queen Mother and the Queen, they're A, very knowledgeable, but B, terribly easy to work with and talk to about something that we both love. The Gold Cup, the champion hurdle, the champion chase, they are the pinnacle, the Oscar, if you like, of the racing world. Over the years, there have been some good days, and I suppose these are the special ones because these are Bobsworth and Long Run's Gold Cups. 2012 was a particularly good Cheltenham festival. Horses' feet vary in size quite considerably. And as you can see, there are big ones and there are little ones. This is actually a youngster of Her Majesty's called Rapid Flight. Uh, he's a, they're all homebred. And um, he's, rather, he's a street horse. He won the other day and he's due to run again this weekend. He doesn't eat the door. But he's just a nice, he's a nice youngster. His life's in front of him, so who knows? And, and what is the breakfast of champions? Well, this morning, he, what, what he's actually had to eat. Yes. Um, he's had a bowl of nuts. He's had some hay. He's been out. He's been actually jumping this morning. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's a rapid flight. He's called rapid flight. So, so lives up I don't know how rapid he is, but he won the other day. And I hope he win again this weekend. Have you ever been to the proms? I haven't, no. <laughs> it's, it's... I'm not very British, am I? <laughs> Could I tempt you with a programme, sir? Oh, my goodness me, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, it's five pounds and it goes to support our charities. And we've just surpassed a million pounds raised for charity. I'm Susie Gregson, founder and chief executive of Proms at St Jude's. I think you're missing three very important letters there, Susie. <laughs> MBE. <laughs> I was awarded an MBE. 
by Her Majesty the Queen. I was awarded it for services to the community, pretty much for founding proms at St Jude's and for keeping it going for so many years. Proms was set up almost 30 years ago. I don't think any of us anticipated that it would last as long as it did and be as much loved as it is. By pulling together, we become a community. And over the years, we've consistently raised money for good causes. It's almost entirely run by volunteers of all ages. Proms isn't a new concept. It started, I think, in the mid 18th century, and it started with pleasure gardens where people could stroll around while musicians played. Well, tonight we've got a wonderful concert with Bremer and Konya Canny Mason. The Canny Masons will be playing Elgar's Suspiri. And Elgar, of course, was actually living in Hampstead when he wrote it. So really, we're playing it on his doorstep. special to play a piece in Hampstead knowing that it was written so close to where we were performing. We both live in West Hampstead. It was a really lovely atmosphere for us to play in. If Algar was sat in the audience, I would love to speak to him afterwards and, and ask um, how mm. he thinks we did and what he thinks we should do or change. I grew up with music around the house. It was always there. So I think that's how I naturally gravitated towards it because I was just immersed in music from a very early age. We were extremely lucky to have parents who grew up loving music. They really believed that it was an essential part of the education. And we've just been really, really lucky to have had um, incredible opportunities and mm. an amazing um, support network. My name is Dylan Kawande. I'm the British-born son of Congolese Rwandan refugees. I set up the hashtag Get Dill to Cambridge campaign to pursue my dream of becoming a lawyer. So my dad received an offer to study at Cambridge University, but he couldn't take up the place because he didn't have the funding. Back in the 90s, my parents migrated to the UK during a time of chaos and disorder. They always dreamed of a better future for myself and my four siblings. So when they came over here, the aspiration was that we would all benefit society. And that has helped me to forge my own path. And despite the financial hurdles of studying law at Cambridge University, I've been able to pursue my dream. Lots of people will recognize my campaign, my hashtag Get Deal to Cambridge campaign. An arduous effort, but definitely worth it. And I wouldn't have had all of these resources if not for the people who believed in me. It's been an amazing journey, an amazing experience. There is still that feeling in rural England there's something rather lovely about it. I love going into old churches in little villages and sensing the history and the sense of peace and quiet. I love going to Grantchester and having cream tea in the orchard tea rooms. Is that the whole of modern Britain? No, of course not but it's part of the whole. Chocolate box, Christmas card, the village. I'm not in a village, I'm a provincial urban lad. So I get much more sentimental by the paintings of uh, L.S. Lowry. Lowry painted the now demolished cityscapes of the north, the mean little houses and streets and the big overpowering factories and churches, smoke in the air. Damp, dirty. 
Well, uh, the North was a bit like that when I was growing up, and uh, I, I, can, I can get sentimental about that rather than anything down at Grantchester with all those posh people. You know, the mountains of the Lake District, the mountains of the Highlands of Scotland, they are some of the oldest land masses in the world. The Himalayas, the, the, the tall mountains these days, are, are new. They've just, cut, just arrived. The Pennines have been here since time immemorial, and uh, I get sentimental about that. If, I, if I'm trying to think what it is to be British, it's to have lived in the variable landscapes. Which people down south here on this little island, people who live in London, they don't know about mountains. There aren't any mountains here. There are a few hills. No mountains. I don't think there's a direct link between us today living in London and the London where Shakespeare lived. I mean, that's long, long ago, and it was very, very different. Very violent, horrible place, actually. Cruelty on the streets, and deaths in the air, short lives, dirty, disease-ridden. Mm -mm. You're at Beckenscott Model Village, the oldest model village in the world. This is where we got the quirky names. The fruiter is, you are a peach, heavenly souls. And this is the smallest Marks and Spencers in the world. What did they sell in the 30s? And they sent us all the information and basically they just sold hats, stockings, shoes, gloves and scarves, things like that, not like they do today. And this is a little memorial to our founder, Roland Cullingham. People think he's buried there, but he's not. Why do you think the 1930s was chosen as the period? I think it was the time was just about right, because I think after that, everything sort of changed, and we, we got it just right. So it was almost like an idyllic, quintessentially British time. Oh, I think so. No doubt about that, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. That is English. Even now, you go out and about, and on a Saturday and Sunday, they're playing cricket. One thing we can't get to scale are the fish. These are enormous mutant whales in scale, so yeah. Do you think the trains run on time here? Oh, definitely. No leaves on the line or anything like that, no. Hiya. Why are Pixar movies so successful? Because yeah. Pixar works for kids and it works yeah. for adults. Maybe that's the secret success formula I, for Beck and Scott. Yeah, I think, I think it is, yeah. You come as a child, you bring your children, you then bring the grandchildren, and it starts all over again. And you've got Ascot Racecourse, as it was in the 1930s. One of our model makers who got the NBE, he went up to meet the Queen. He actually spoke to the Queen for, it seemed a lot longer than everyone else, because she said, oh, I came such and such a year, and he said, excuse me, Mum, you, you came in whatever, and they chatted, you know. If it had been anyone else, it had been off with his head, you know. <laughs> Her Majesty came with Queen Mary in 34 and 39. The royal family has decided that it will define itself through its theatrical presentation of itself. And a parade, a, a royal parade, is something quite remarkable, and it's very British. This is the first time we've had an opportunity to celebrate a platinum jubilee. The first time in all our history somebody should be on the track for 70 years. How fantastic is that? Without a doubt, over the last few years, the most extraordinary person, not just who is British, is, of course, Her Majesty the Queen. What an amazing woman. Well, she means the glue that holds the nation together. Because if you look back, she's been one of the most effective and best monarchs we've ever had. 
The Queen means everything. She's iconic. She is an incredible role model. She's been a fantastic public servant. The sport of kings, it has to be renamed the sport of queens. She's a star. Like, you know, Queen is someone everyone has to look up to. Oh, I love the Queen. Who we'll raise a glass to the Queen? Without the Queen being here, this country wouldn't be what it is. Exactly. But the royal family, aren't they German in origin? We don't. We don't look on that. No. No. They've become British, so I'm not sure whether one would call them English. Oh, they're English, they're not German. They, they are Anglo-Saxon. Well, where did the Anglo-Saxons come from? The reason they are very British is that they are very British. <laughs> They're hugely valued for what they offer and for what they represent. The monarch has to be apolitical, but it doesn't stop us, the world, the papers, analysing perhaps some moments that seem slightly more provocative. Her most marked sartorial choices was at the state opening of Parliament in 2017. She came in steadfast in a beautiful mid-blue suit, matching hat, with a perhaps not too subtle circular formation of star-like yellow flowers resembling the European flag. Part of me thinks if she was allowed to talk, she would be disappointed that we were breaking our ties with Europe. But only she knows, and maybe her dresser. I was 20 years old. I remember all the people in the street, myself included, to see the car and the queen. Everybody was amazed by that. That was an amazing day. So you saw the Queen go by in her Absolutely. Room. Were there George's crosses on the streets then? Ah, that's a good question. I don't remember that. <laughs> As a country, we're, we're pretty good at friendly appropriation of other people's property. I mean, St George, I don't think St George was actually an Englishman. I don't know too much about him. I'm pretty sure he is uh, the, a saint, the personification of, of Britain. So, yeah. The Genoese in the north of Italy, their state flag was the white and red flag that we know as the English flag. From a footballer perspective, you know, we look at that flag with real pride and as something to fight for and as something that we want to kind of take across and do the best we could. So I always had a lot of love and, and pride towards St George's Cross. I'm very pleased to have a conversation with you guys because you ask me a good question. Why there are very little Italian flag here and there is also a St. George flag? St. George flag was adopted in Genoa immediately after the first crusade. The King of England decided to ask the permission to the Genoa Republic to use the Genoa flag in order to be safe cruising in the Mediterranean area. Our so-called English flag, we were actually shelling out the Reddies year by year saying, hello, Genoa, sorry, you know, we owe you a bit of money for our national flag. Here you are, darling. I was not able to understand why. Why they stopped in 1599. Our king or queen said, I think we've had enough of paying out for this Genoese flag, and I like the flag, let's keep it. So this is really our flag. We wrote down a letter to the queen, to Buckingham Palace. We received a very good letter back from Buckingham Palace. I'm very proud of that, saying the big thanks. Maybe one day, with all the money coming from the flag, we may reconstruct uh, the Republic of Genoa. That could be a good idea. Don't say it uh, because this is illegal, so I'm not going to say that, <laughs> OK? <laughs> we need to have a conversation about the St. George flag. We love it, and I'm sure you guys love it too. We can decide that April 23rd, we should have a celebration all together. People from England and people from Genoa. I, before starting this documentary, thought that the St. George's flag is a quintessentially English flag. But filming this documentary, we discovered that English stole it from the Italians, from the Genoese. Uh, well, to be honest, it doesn't really surprise me. We're quite a thievery, thievery uh, nation, I suppose. <laughs> I'm not surprised to learn that that has a story. What you've just told me is all brand new information, but very interesting that maybe comes yeah, up in a quiz one day that I might use. What 
is actually British, think about it. Fish and chips isn't, tea isn't. A cup of tea, cup of char, sir, cup of char, lovely cockney, cup of char. It's not a cockney word at all, char. Char is a Mandarin Chinese word. He is from China. Yeah, so I think that's something to link um, the two cultures together. Three times the number of British people have an Indian dish every week. Wow, that's great, OK? <laughs> Which dish in Indian? Like, what well, do they like? They say the chicken tikka masala. Wow, chicken tikka masala, nice. That's my favourite too. <laughs> Wanna, what's the national dish? Well, we definitely at home still have fish and chips every Friday evening from the local fish and chip shop. <laughs> fish and chips, that is the quintessential English dish. Thank you very much to those Jewish immigrants from Europe who brought the idea of fried fish with them. Beef, of course, is, is, is a French word, boeuf. Mutton and lamb comes from the Normans. Oh, and thank you very much to the Vikings because they brought this idea of smoking fish and preserving fish, so smoked salmon and smoked haddock and kippers. Thank you very much to the Vikings. Pork, not pig, pork, foreign word. Because the French were better cooks, was that the reason? Imagine the UK about any Caribbean influence. Rum punch, jerk chicken, red stripe, like, a British person's one of their favourite beers is generally a red stripe. Everyone knows it. Beer, English, bitter beer, one of the most famous in the world. That's not English. 500 years ago, we didn't have any hops. They came from the Netherlands, from what is now Belgium and Holland. They had hops. They showed us how to make beer. Cider, cider, English cider's lovely. Thank you, the Normans. Thank you, William the Conqueror, for bringing all your apples over and showing us how to make cider. Whiskey, now that'll be British. Would it? Why don't you ask the Irish? Because it's probably the Irish who invented whiskey. Gin, now gin, the quintessential English drink. No, it isn't. We got the idea from Holland and they got the idea from North Africa via Italy. Not English at all. Where did the sausage come from, the British sausage? You can't get those abroad. And there's nothing like one. A British sausage, superior to any sausage I've ever had anywhere else in the world. Like, was that not quintessentially British? Who are really English is quite hard to say, really. If you look at the history, the more you look back, the more interesting it gets, and the more different peoples come into the equation. It's so fascinating to see one wave of immigrants after another, so, and it's still continuing, of course. We've had to face our, you know, our, um, all our phobias, haven't we? Our, our racisms and our fears and our anxieties about the other. But, but we're all the other. We are the other, of course we're mongrels. That's what's so absolutely wonderful. This has in some ways always been a multicultural society. It's more evident now because of obviously the end of empire and the whole impact of a commonwealth and all of those things. It's been very interesting to see how many people have been very keen to live in Britain. Is it just about there being a national health system and there being a social security system of a kind that you certainly don't get into in the United States. No, it's about more than that. It's, it's about people uh, being attracted to certain assumptions about the way we live. I come, my family come from Ireland. We know all about um, wanting to be accepted as, as, as foreigners in this country. It takes a while but we do integrate, we do welcome people from abroad. We always have. Churchill, he was half American. Hmm? He was half, his mother was American. Well, well maybe that's quintessentially British that in fact you're not local at all. You're, you're, you're an invader or an immigrant or a started from somewhere else, why not? I, I, you know, I love the idea of uh, this country being multiracial, which it, which it gloriously is. In an ideal world, I like the, the sense that anybody could consider themselves to call Britain home, because I think that's, at, at, at its best, 
uh, when, it's, when, it, when it celebrates how cosmopolitan it is. I get frustrated when British people think that we're not inclusive and that we're not all embracing because from what I've seen from my travels is, is that we are. We, we, we really are. Your surname is Petrucci. Mm. Is that an English surname? It's Italian, Sicilian, my granddad. Lorna is a truly British company and I'm very proud of the fact because of course my background was originally from Germany. Jakob Dega came over from Germany in 1855. My great-great-grandfather was also a tailor in London. His son and Mr. Dega's, or now it's pronounced Deej, their two sons got on very well, so they actually started up on their own. Culturally, I think because of the richness of people's experiences from the Caribbean, from India, from Africa, from um, Europe, obviously makes it far richer. And there is really something for everyone. Oh, we are in Chinatown. Phenomenon. <laughs> Amazing place, yeah. It's a good place to mix with, with the British culture and international culture and uh, Oriental Chinese culture as well. There's so many Indians over here and I don't feel like I'm, I'm an outsider. I feel like I belong to this place. British Asians are definitely a huge part of Britain. With our cuisines, with our commerce, with our cricket, there are a lot of dishes uh, in our culture to have worth celebrating that. When I was retraining my career in horticulture, Lensley was kind of spoken of in hushed terms then. It was the lost hidden gem. It was shut for, you know, eight to ten years. Ironically, for a quintessentially English woodland garden, it was saved by a, a South African-born family. So Penny Streeter and her family bought it, reopened it, and are driving it forward, making it what it is today. Elgar was, it was often considered quintessentially English, but a lot of the influences were European. It's not unusual for foreign influences to find their way into British culture, British society. The same is true of cricket. It probably originated in southeast England, but there is a competing theory which suggests the game was imported by Flemish weavers who arrived in this country in the 16th and 17th century. So foreign influences have made their way into English cricket just as they have into every other aspect of British life. Britishness for me is not about being insular. It's about being open to the world, absorbing influences and being able in turn to influence. And that I think is one of the things that makes us special. Britain, 300 years old. England, 1100 years old. They're very different things historically. They often say about England that it's really the history of the shires, that, that is our sort of back in the mist of time is, our, is, is where we come from, as it were. It's very interesting that the British are often called the English, which extremely annoys members of the other nations. Now, where I come from is extremely English. On all sides of my family, English. You have Irish ancestry as well. I do. Do you consider yourself quintessentially English or British? <laughs> it's very interesting you should ask that. As I've just done that programme, who do you think you are? So there is a huge slice of me that is Irish. And I was born in England. And then there's a lot of something elsewhere as well. <laughs> I, I can't say anymore. I'm kind of like a kind of fruitcake. Yes, and I discovered when I did the same programme that uh, I had a, quite a recent relative who was a professional actor. I could feel myself to be a Kiwi, having worked there for quite a lot. Sean, born and bred in Swansea in South Wales and lived in London most of his life, still feels he's abroad when he's in London. I think I've brought my Welshness with me throughout my whole life, everywhere I've been. But I've lived in South Africa, I've lived in America, I've lived in England, so I've lived all over the world. And if you ask me in 10 years, I'll probably be clearer. But at the moment, I'm certainly feeling very Welsh, yeah. Blood-wise, I'm half Irish, so I, I feel like um, I'm a bit, bit of everything. Um, but I guess I'd quite enjoy playing up to being a little bit of a stereotype.
of somebody who's English, but you know, and sort of sounding posh, but I'm not really posh either. Uh, I just I just happen to have a posh voice, but my parents are from South East London, so they talk like that. So I don't know what I am, but I quite enjoy playing a bit of a character. And if I'm really feeling it, I like to pretend I'm in Downton Abbey. That's usually when I'm at home. Oh, ooh, quintessentially British, I think. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to think. I think British is probably how I would, I would identify myself with, purely and simply because of the diverse nature of where I'm from. You know, my dad's from Jamaica, my mum's from England and Wales, and you know, I think to en encapsulate as many of the islands as I possibly can and, and areas then uh, within to myself, that's why I'd probably call myself British over just English. English. Yeah. Why? Um. I don't really know, to be honest. <laughs> British is a bit, um, <coughs> maybe, sensitive at the moment. English. English. And why so decisively? Why? Because that's our origin. We are English. Yep, definitely. So I feel I completely identify as a very British person. Yeah, I'm very much a proud Brit, absolutely. <laughs> I'm from... Mom of Shear, the border of Wales, so I think I always sounded very English to the Welsh people and very Welsh to the English people, so I think I've always had a slightly mongrelised accent. So you're not so, born British, you have it thrust upon you. I would consider myself English, though my parents were both from Glasgow. Yes, I think I do consider myself quintessentially English. I would consider myself British. The connotations of being considered English are fairly negative, but I still feel. I am English, I am British, I am Congolese, I'm Rwandan, I'm a Christian, I'm black. You know, I'm, I'm happy to wear that complexity with pride. When people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from the Caribbean. Because, like, I am, and I'm very proud to be from the Caribbean. I am English, and proudly English, and I am Irish, and proudly Irish. Quintessentially British. I've never thought of myself as English. I think we're, we're a generation that have grown up being Brits rather than English, in a way. If not more, European. I am English. I was born in England, but I also consider myself British. And to be honest, in the current political climate, I consider myself European as well. I'm not allowed to say I consider myself European. Delete that bit from the... Um, uh, <laughs> I consider myself British. I'm Lancashire all the way through. I'm Chorley all the way through. We've got great sport, we've got great food, walk and bay shrimps, berry black pudding, Uncle Joe's mint balls from Wigan. With all this coming out of Lancashire, we've so much to offer. So what do I call myself? A Lancastrian. Proud to be a Lancastrian, proud of my accent, proud of the north of England. And of course, yes, I'm English, but I'm British as well and I represent a parliament that covers the United Kingdom, and that matters to me. So, of course, yes, I am British, I am English, but I'm a true Lancastrian. I was born in England. I have a deep attachment to England, but I want to be part of an internationalist future, uh, not an English past. I spent a lot of my school days in university time being taught that nationalism had been a very bad, narrow thing, which was now extinct. And yet we now see a new brand of, of narrow Englishness that I think is terribly sad. And I think it should be possible both to celebrate a, yes, quintessentially British or quintessentially English occasion like this uh, without uh, wanting to take the whole country into standing on the White Cliffs of Dover, giving two fingers to Johnny Farnham. OK? <laughs>
We did have a previous master who was burned at the stake. I hope this isn't a pattern that will be repeated for, for present and future masters. I think, Frank, it's gin o'clock, so it's been so nice meeting you. And then this is um, what we have very much enjoyed. Creating, making, and then drinking. Mind you, it was four years of making and it was nine months of tasting gin. <laughs> Can you think of any Shakespearean expressions off the top of your head? Unless poor Yorif, I knew him well. Not me. <laughs> That's good for him. You know I'm educated boy. <laughs> London taxi driver, see? We know a bit yeah, about everything. More than me. A bit about everything. I like to use Therein Lies the Rub when I'm often making a joke about something where, you know, it just maybe doesn't work properly or whatever, it's not a big deal. It's like, ah, Therein Lies the Rub. But of course, you know, when it was used in the play originally, it was for a very tragic situation, you know, probably something like in death, it usually is in, in Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> Wherefore art thou, Romeo? She who doth protest, you know, that sometimes gets said in a bit of a joking way when you're like, well, I'm really not bothered about this, but, you know. <laughs> Personally, I didn't like Shakespeare. You know, the British have Shakespeare and us Chinese have Confucius. <laughs> Though this is madness, there is method in it. Such sweet sorrow. It's like she sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. But if she sells seashells on the seashore, then I'm sure she sells seashore shells. And I bet Ian McKellen can't do that. Shakespeare knew and said often to his characters that all the world's a stage. All the men and women merely play it. We're all acting.